Um, tonight we've got a lecture on uh, the Army years here at the seminary. We do focus on our tours, if you've been on our tours, largely on the school years. So it's really exciting that we've got Don as one of our board members now. He is an Army historian and has contributed a lot to our knowledge of the seminary during the Army's occupation. Um, Don is an active duty colonel. He's assigned to Walter Reed, um, so he, and he lives here at the seminary. He is also an assistant professor of medical history at the Uniform Services University. Uh, when he's not busy researching military and medical history, which he does a lot of, um, he is an atomic scientist. Um, and he is also a paratrooper. And he has made 39 successful jumps out of 41. <laughs> so welcome to Don. Yeah, thank you. I like to say it's 41 successful exits, 31, 39 successful landings, with the definition of a successful landing being one you walk away from. Yeah, I've met one lady who tonight who lived in the ballroom during the Army years. I met you at another dinner, and you lived in the ballroom during the Army years. Is there anybody else that worked here during the Army years? Okay, there's another one. How many of you saw the ad in the Walter Reed paper and decided to come tonight? Okay, it worked. Yeah, you did too, or did I email you? Okay. Anyway, um, last time I talked, I talked about um, the Army's takeover, um, where it fit in the big picture, and some of the things the Army did when they first took over the property. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to be more stream of consciousness. I've been rummaging around the Walter Reed Garrison archives and have some nifty pictures that have nifty stories associated with them. And so what I want to do tonight is show some of the pictures and talk about the pictures and some of the things they show. And those of you who lived or worked here, feel free if you want to throw something in. I'll pass the mic to you because I am not, by all means, an expert on what life was actually like here during the Army years. I should tell you that, that the photos I got from DPW, they insisted that they be approved by a PAO, so the PAO has approved my photos for public release, but since I never script anything, they said, please give us a copy of the tape so we can look at it when you're done. So hopefully, Joyce, I won't be needing your help in a couple of days. Um, She's one of the Walter Reed lawyers. Anyway, next slide, please. I have to put a caveat, and could you use the mouse and click on this little X so that thing goes away, because it's annoying. This is it. Well, that didn't work. All right, now, now come down here and, and push that button right there. No, that wasn't the one. Oh, there we go. Okay, I should point out that what I'm saying is my views. They've not been approved by the Department of Defense. They do not reflect the Department of Defense's opinion, nor have they been approved by Save Our Seminary and, uh, or the Homeowners Association. Pick any group I belong to, and uh, they're, not, they're not affiliated with that. And next slide, please. down arrow. Okay, as I said, most of these photographs came from a very interesting gentleman in the basement of Walter Reed. And I went down and I saw him and I said, show me what you got on the seminary and he pulled out like eight boxes of stuff. And here, I've read the condemnation proceedings from the court. I can tell you it was more complex than we thought. The seminary was not one large plot of land. The seminary was several plots, some owned by the National Park Seminary Incorporated, some owned by Mrs. Ament, some owned by Roy Tasco Davis, um, some given away by Roy Tasco Davis to the county. So it's, it's, it's very interesting when you start to dig into this stuff. But I can say that all the court proceedings took place after the meeting between Mr. Davis and General Mariette. So 
some of us had a conspiracy theory that, you know, they'd been working on this in advance. If they did, they didn't go to court to do it until afterwards. So next slide, please. Okay, getting ahead of myself. I said 1942, the Army took over the property. They renovated from September to December 1942. To put it in perspective, they spent $890,000 on the property and then spent $918,000 converting it to a hospital. It was one of 28 such properties that were taken over by the Army in 1942 in anticipation of casualties from a cross-channel attack in 1943. They took over the Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia. They took over the Kellogg Estate in Battle Creek, Michigan. They took over hotels in Florida and California with the idea being that we can put patients there while we build more hospitals. And by 1943, they stopped that program because it was not cost effective. I kind of hope, think that the seminary's price versus renovations proved to them that it wasn't. And after 1942, they would buy large vacant plots of land and build hospitals from the ground up. Um, between 1943 and 1945, they did additional renovations as they found things that needed to be fixed. That's when they ripped up all the carpeting throughout the building because it was so worn after the first year they were in here that, uh, that they couldn't use it anymore. That's when they built, and I'm going to talk about some of them, the cinder block buildings that many of you may remember. They were not barracks, and I'll talk a bit more about that. So for those of you who missed my lecture a year and a half ago, that pretty much sums it up. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Bonnie said I was going to talk about where the, semin or where the seminary and where the Forest Glen Annex fit into the big picture of Walter Reed. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a lot of pictures that kind of tied it in. This picture right here from the Army's Centennial History of Walter Reed shows a number of patients on an ambulance train uh, being brought to Walter Reed. So here's what happened. Um, and I'll talk about this briefly and then I'll get into the pictures. But Bonnie said I was going to talk about this, so I'm going to talk about it. Um, in World War II, if you were injured, they would assess your condition and if you would return to duty within a specified period of time, what was called the theater evacuation policy, you were held in Europe or in the Pacific until you were well and returned to the fight. Early on in the war, when we didn't have a lot of hospitals deployed overseas, that might be 30 days. And by the end of the war in 1945, it was six months. So if they looked at you and you were going to return to duty within six months, you didn't come to the States. If they looked at you and said, you're not going to return to duty, then they packed you up and put you on the first ship sailing. And you came across the ocean, not by air. They weren't doing air evacuation back then. Arrived at the port of Baltimore, were loaded on a train like this, brought to the Tacoma Park, D.C. train station, where you were met by an ambulance bus, and you were brought to the Walter Reed main campus, which had at that time operating 2,000 beds. And there you would receive your care, your initial care, your initial assessments, anything that was complex was done there. And then after they evaluated your condition, they sorted you and sent you to one of three places. If they looked at you and said, you know, whatever's wrong with you, maybe it was malaria, you know, maybe it was a, a gunshot wound to soft tissue and it was going to heal, and you were going to return to duty and go back to the fight, they sent you to Greenbelt, Maryland. If you know where the Agricultural Center is in Greenbelt, that was a Civilian Conservation Corps camp. Um, imagine the tar paper buildings they had built during the 30s. They had taken that over. And they called it a reconditioning battalion. And what they did was they did drill and ceremony and physical training and, and soldier stuff, you know, practicing your basic soldier skills. And when you were ready to go back to the fight, they put you on a ship and they sailed you back to the war. 
Okay? That's important because early on, when the theater evacuation policy was short, um, you were getting a lot of soldiers who were going to return to the fight. And then as the number of casualties or number of hospitals became set up in Europe, particularly, because Walter Reed saw mostly European casualties, um, you weren't seeing those. And then you saw the ones that were more severely injured, although you'd be seeing those. And those got split between um, two types of facilities. If you were so severely injured that basically, and I, I, I don't like the term, but I can't come up with a better one, but warehoused. You were, you know, paralyzed from the neck down, let's say, or you were a triple amputee. Things that nowadays, you know, we can, we can do marvelous things with. Back then they couldn't. You went to the Veterans Administration. And the Veterans Administration had these big thousand bed hospitals that were full of soldier, former soldiers, sailors, and airmen who were very severely injured and just couldn't really return to society. Um, nowadays, they don't do that. That's why they have all these empty hospitals that were built in World War II. If they looked at you and said, you're going to return to society, but you need some training and you need some life skills and you, know, you have an amputation, we're going to teach you how to use that amputation or use your new artificial limb or, you know, you used to be a you know, a farmer and because you lost a leg you can't do that anymore, we're going to teach you business skills. You know, they taught typing classes here, they taught accounting classes, they, and we'll see it in the video, they taught you how to drive a car with, and change a tire with a hook, that type of thing. So that's the sort of stuff that was going on here at Forest Glen during World War II. And those people returned to society, but generally not to the fight. Greenbelt returned to the fight, and the VA, um, they were in long-term care. So, and of course, the, the, the Veterans Administration, you would be sent to a hospital that was closest to your home of record, so you'd be close to your family, and things like that. So, that's how World War II worked at, at Forest Glen. We have a picture over here. You've all seen it before, I'm sure of amputees sitting out by the fountain. One of the reasons they liked Forest Glen was there were no elevators in the building. The dental clinic was on the third floor. You know, the dining facility was on the first floor. Patients here would get up in the morning, make their own beds. Um, they would go to classes. They would go to physical therapy. Um, and the terrain was, was rugged, so they could again get to learn how to use their prosthetics. You know, I, your, tooth hurt, your tooth hurts, climb three flights of stairs and get it fixed. You're hungry, down three flights. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough love. It's tough love. Sometimes I wish we still did that, but I won't go there. Next slide, please. Okay, this is my first of my pictures from DPW. This is an aerial photograph of the seminary taken in 1951. Okay, it's, I apologize for the clarity of it, um, but let's point out some things. There's the train track we all know and love. This is Linden Lane coming right along here and then turning up this way. You can see the gymnasium, you can see the stables, you can see the big building, or the long, narrow building they built over here. Here's Maine, of course, we're right here, right now. Um, some interesting things, there used to be an orchard on the property. I was not aware of that until I saw this picture. Um, this is roughly where the ball fields are and the um, Fisher houses are right now. Um, it got cut down sometime in the 50s. This is the big barn that's now abandoned. This is the little barn that's now a gymnasium. Um, but what I really want to talk about is this right here. This little complex right here, it's, it's on the other side of the Glen right here. It's kind of separated from everything else. If you're familiar with World War II construction, you would recognize that as a company barracks complex. It has company admin, it has company supply, it has 
a barracks for each platoon, and it has a dining facility called dining facility number nine, if you keep track of that stuff. Now you ask yourself, well, why are they eating here when they have this big dining facility over here? They had what was stationed here in World War II, what's called a service company, okay? And if, you, if you're familiar with euphemisms in the Jim Crow Army, a service company was a segregated um, black company, sometimes with white officers, sometimes not. And, and frankly, in the 1940s, they even put in publications, well, you should put Southern officers in charge because they know how to deal with the people assigned to the company. I mean, this is, this is the dark side of Walter Reed in World War II. But I point it out um, because you'll see in some of the old pictures of these barracks, of course, right here is where the warehouse is right now. Um, Bill is back here. Um, and, and, and what they did is they did manual labor. Um, you know, so if something needs fixed, they were doing the fixing. You know, if the grounds needed maintenance, they were doing the grounds maintenance and things like that. Uh, but they ate by themselves. They recreated by themselves. Of course, all that changed in 1947. The other thing you can see here is this is Ireland Drive right here, the paved section. And you can see how it hooks back to Rock Creek Park where now this road is blacktop. And you'll notice it's all open. Okay, and if you look at the trees, you can also see nowadays, you know, you've got the really big trees and this area down here is kind of where the swamp is. And it's got little trees and that's why. They let it, they let it just naturally revert back. So I think this is interesting because it shows some of the things that were going on in the 40s at the time. Uh, ball field actually was put in by the school um, and then the Army used it. You can see some landfill going on over here and over here. Um, so anyway, the Army in 1945, uh, 1951. Next slide, please. Now let's talk, I'll go back to 1946. We all know that Save Our Seminary kind of had its origination when the Army was talking about tearing everything down and building family housing back in the 1970s. You can't tear this down. You know, it's, it's, it's Army property. What we find is that in 1946, the Army Surgeon General, General Kirk, announced that they were going to build a thousand bed hospital on Forest Glen. And additionally, they were going to move the Army Medical Museum here. I thought that was kind of interesting um, because he does say it's going to take a few years to do it all. And of course, the museum is moving here in April, or excuse me, June. Um, and they're going to move the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology here. Of course, if you know, as part of BRAC, the tissue bank that they maintain at AFIP is moving to the Forest Glen Annex. And he says it'll take 12 years to do this. So you're all going, oh, okay, there was a lot of empty land in that picture. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the plan for it. This is, this is turned sideways. So right here, you have the railroad track. This is Seminary Road right here. The train station area, train station right here. The post office in the post office building. You know where that triangle is, everybody, right? This is, this is Brookville Road right here, and this is Linden Lane. And you can see where the hospital sits. As near as I can tell, my house is right about here. So in 1946, they were planning on tearing down, and this is, this is Rock Creek Park down here. So they were going to use every available square foot of land on here. 1946. This is new stuff. So you've got the hospital, you've got graduate teaching center, Officer housing over here, officers club, enlisted club, NCO club. They liked to party in 1946. Um, logistical support over in this area. Officers quarters with a view over Rock Creek, which is a swamp now. More officers quarters, I mean, 1946. 
1947. It didn't happen because, if you're familiar with what happened to the Defense Department after the end of the war, they went on some major cost-saving moves and uh, they weren't spending money. Then we got a perfectly good 2,000-bed hospital at Walter Reed. We got 1,000 beds there in the annex. We don't need to build this. Forget about it. Except for the museum that was going to move here. I mean, it's moving here now, so we're okay. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Next slide, please. Okay. One of the things I always get asked about is, who are the streets named after? This picture was taken in, on September 17, 1954. This lady here is Mrs. Marie W. Ireland. This is her son right here. This guy right here is the president of the Forest Glen Park Civic Association. This guy right here is the president of the Silver Spring Junior Chamber of Commerce. This is General Heaton, commander of the hospital, later Surgeon General for 10 years. And they are here to dedicate Ireland Drive to Marie W. Ireland. So, next slide. I'm not going to tell you who everybody the streets were named after are and what they did. So, those of you who live on some of these streets may want to write this down. Marie W. Ireland. Marie Ireland never served at Walter Reed at all. Not a day. Um, didn't command Walter Reed. He was General Pershing's surgeon in the American Expeditionary Force in World War I. Uh, promoted to two-star, and then became the Surgeon General and was the Surgeon General for 13 years. They don't do that anymore. It's like four and you're out. Um, but he was responsible for a major portion of the construction that took place on the Walter Reed main campus. So those of you who are familiar with the wings on Building 1, he built the wings on Building 1. The Red Cross building, he built the Red Cross building. Um, he didn't build it personally, of course. He, uh, he got the Sternberg Auditorium built in the middle of the rare, old rare building, for those of you who've ever been in there. Um, so he was a friend of Walter Reed, and so they decided they were going to name Ireland Drive after him. And we've all heard the speech on Ireland Drive. We know how it runs. Um, actually, only about half of Ireland Drive is left because it looped around Oh, back by the old farmhouse on the, on the plantation, and the circle in front of it was named Ireland Circle. Major General Wallace DeWitt, okay. He was a former commander of Walter Reed. He commanded Walter Reed during the 30s. So DeWitt Circle and DeWitt Drive are named after him. Um, the hospital at Fort Belvoir is currently named after him as well, soon to be abandoned in the new Fort Belvoir Community Hospital. Um, but it'll still be DeWitt in our hearts. So that's what he did. Excuse me. Borden Drive, Borden Drive doesn't exist anymore. Borden Drive was the name of the bridge that ran from Colonial House across over to the villa and then continued on across what is now the Beltway. That was Borden Drive. It's named after Major William C. Borden. He was the guy who had the idea of a medical center in D.C. named after Walter Reed. He's the guy that took out Walter Reed's appendix, which is what Walter Reed died from. Um, so maybe he felt guilty, I don't know. Um, he and Walter Reed were instructors at the Army Medical School together, so he was a longtime friend of Walter Reed. Then we have Hume Drive. Hume Drive is the one that runs behind the townhouses. That is named after Major General Edward Erskine Hume. He served at Walter Reed, but he is best known as he had been the uh, UN forces in Korea command surgeon during the Korean War. Remember, these buildings were named in 1954, and so that's what he did. Okay. Smith Drive that leads down to the villa. Everyone says, who's Smith? It's named after Major Genevieve Smith. She was a nurse corps officer who had served at Walter Reed, who was killed in a plane crash on the way to Korea in 1951. Um, 
the, if, if, you, if you know the history, the villa was used as nurses' quarters, and so it was appropriate. And the circle in front of the villa it was named Smith Circle. Then Sachs, Lieutenant General Jerome G. Sachs, he was a Medical Service Corps officer, also killed in a plane crash on the way to Korea. I suspect that he and Major Smith were on the same plane. Um, so that, but again, he had been assigned to Walter Reed, so you see the Walter Reed connection. Then you have three enlisted soldiers. None of their streets exist anymore. They were lost over time, but all three of them were killed in Korea. Um, and I can, yeah. One of them was a signal, a signal Corps soldier who had been the switchboard operator here at, at Forest Glen and uh, he was killed in action. The other two were medics who were killed in action as well. So those are the guys the streets are named after if you ever wondered. If you wanna know what they looked like, if you'll go to the next slide. Okay, I have pictures of some of them. This is General Ireland. That's his official Surgeon General portrait. I had a picture of General DeWitt, but I couldn't get it off my camera. I was down at DeWitt Hospital, and they got a painting of him on the wall, and I took a picture of that. And I took a picture of the painting he has on the wall at Walter Reed, and I can't figure out how to email him. So you're stuck with this picture of, of General DeWitt. This is Mrs. Calvin Coolidge right here, and they are cutting a cake in honor of the Red Cross volunteers, and they wore, they wore gray outfits, so they were known at Walter Reed for years as the gray ladies. And this was probably, since this was the 30s, this was probably the 20th or 25th anniversary of the Grey Lady's presence at Walter Reed. Um, I didn't talk about General Beach, but that's General Beach. He was the commander of Walter Reed as well. That's him right there. I took a picture of his painting in Walter Reed, and I couldn't email it either. You know, you think an atomic scientist could work a cell phone. Um, Anyway, but it's okay because the picture they have of him and Walter Reed, he's got this really squirrely looking non-regulation mustache. I would have been ashamed to have it on because, you know, it wasn't really growing. This is Edward Erskine Hume as a one star during World War II. This is Major Borden. He's got the best looking uniform of the lot, I think. Um, of course, none of those medals are Army medals. They're just kind of like stuff he got from clubs he belonged to. I'm serious. This is, this is the AMSIS medal right here. That's the one they still say, well, we think you can wear it, but the Army says you can't. There it stands. Do what your conscience says. Like, I ain't wearing it. I know better. I don't want to be on Army Times cover. Anyway, next slide, please. Okay. These are some pictures of the buildings during the 40s and 50s. This is the castle in 1948. You can see this is... Trying to, this, is the, this is the side where you go up where the porch is. You know, the porch is like right there. Um, you know, before they put that roof thing with the tarp to keep the water from causing the floors to collapse into the basement, which didn't work. Um, there you can see the, the drawbridge right there. Uh, this photo was taken in 1951 of the front area. You can see the cupola that hasn't fallen down. And, Go back three slides. I forgot to point out some stuff. Right there. I love this picture because you can see on here the, the fire escapes, you know, and, and how, how ornate the grill work is on those old fire escapes. Um, they, predate, they predate the school. Then you got up here a giant speaker and a bunch of little speakers so they could play Reveille every morning and taps every night because, you know, it was an army base. And that's what they do. I'm trying to see if it's still, I can't tell if that's still the slate roof or not. I suspect it is, but I can't really tell. We know that originally the school had a slate roof and sometime along the way they, uh, they changed it over to asphalt. Um, you know, this little bush, everybody knows what that little bush looks like now. It's like huge. So anyway, next slide, please. Oh, go back where we were. Is yeah. the castle still there? Oh, the, <laughs> yes and no. Define still there. 
The castle walls are still there. It has a makeshift kind of roof thing built over it and some blue tarps. But if you look in the hole in the window in the door, you will see that the floors have all collapsed into the basement. And they're kind of like at odd angles. And apparently there's a flock of vultures that has a nest up here. And so all the vulture droppings are down in the basement and it's, it's a fixer-upper. <laughs> let's, let's just say that. Bonnie won't let me in it, you know. But I know there's a window down here that's boarded up that when the wind comes and the wind rushes through the hole in the roof because there's no roof left, it blows that thing out. So I may have to put one foot inside just so I can say I set foot in it. And this is the... Um, this is the big barn. You all know what this looks like now. Looks like a bomb went off in it. And, uh, you know, it, it, they may tear it down. Judy can't tell me. Um, this was the audiology lab. And so if you had hearing problems and you came back from the war, that's where you went when they did, you know, hearing aids back in World War II or these, you know, huge, huge things. And they were working, they were doing experiments on how to miniaturize them. Walter Reed, since it opened, has always done research. And that was research that was going on here. And then we have this building right here. This was the prosthetic lab um, after World War II. And they did a lot of research into prosthetic technology after the war, during the Korean War, during the Vietnam War. And a lot of that took place here. This was originally built as an auto repair shop where they taught, again, these, these injured soldiers who were learning new skills would learn how to do repairs to cars and, and that sort of thing. Not so you could fix your own car, but so you could go out and get a job fixing other people's cars. Um, and near as I can tell, my house sits right about there. Um, Chris, yours is probably back right about there. Next slide, please. Okay. Here we have a nice aerial view of, uh, of the seminary. I can't quite tell when this is, but you can see that they have cut down the orchard, which was right here, and they started to do landfill. Okay. The greenhouse, well, back here you've got the um, Spanish mission right there. This is the greenhouse that sat, sits behind it now. That's where it used to be. This house here was the one that was torn down. I have some great pictures I didn't bring of the tree that smashed through the roof. That's the reason they tore it down. There again, you can see the big building built on what was the old athletic field. Then you have the other buildings back here. Again, originally built as assorted classrooms. They had a radio studio in there. So if your brothers were to, to learn how to run radio equipment to do commercial broadcasting or you felt you were a future Rush Limbaugh, um, you would get classes in there and help run the Walter Reed radio station, which was not only broadcast but was also piped into all the patient rooms. Um, again, they had classes in typing and things. My first visit to the Forest Glen Annex in 1983 was to this building right here, which was the health physics office at the time. And they complained that every time they moved radioisotopes from this building to the main campus, they were crossing state lines, and it caused all kinds of paperwork. And the interesting thing I like about this picture is you can see that there are covered walkways built between the gymnasium and these buildings over here. So, you know, the old tradition that the girls wouldn't get wet, well, the Army liked that idea, and so they built these buildings too. You can see the stairway at this end of the building that's no longer there. And let's see, Beltway's been built, so that place is this probably late 60s, because they haven't knocked down everything over here to build the commissary yet. Next slide, please. This is a later picture. Um, this one is, is, is taken from the other view. Now you can see in this one, you know, that the, uh, the walking bridge has been knocked down, but the abutments are still there and standing tall. Um, the bridge here is still there. That's the, uh, 
I believe that's the pergola bridge right there. And then the bridge that was here has already been knocked down. And then you can see it appears that they have started the construction on the commissary, but it's really hard to tell. We we're trying to figure out when, this is Steve's house right here, when they put the addition on the front to try and date it. But you can see up here that are not here anymore, the skylights, because if, if, if you know about the seminary, the third floor on this side of the gymnasium, or excuse me, on, the, on this side of the ballroom was actually the art studio for the students and had skylights to let in plenty of light so they could do their artwork. And you can see, and you can see in later pictures that they were taken out and, and boarded up. And uh, of course the Odeon is still here. They're doing some work on the lawn here, but you can see essentially things remain pretty much the same way as they did in 1945. So you have the, you know, you can see, you know, here Linden Lane still got the, you know, shrubbery on either side of it and some more over there. And, and, and so this picture is from AFIP, by the way. Next slide, please. I love this picture. This picture is from 1962. These guys up here are patients. And you see they've got like two step ladders with, it looks like, two two by sixes. And it looks like here like they nailed two together to make it long enough to go. I haven't shown this to the Walter Reed safety guy because he'd go nuts. And, and then you look at the patient that's up here and he's already got his arm in a cast. So I don't know if you got that falling out of the, falling off of here. Or, uh, but, but it's, it's, you know, they made the patients do work when they, when they were around here. Of course, it's got the third level and, of course, the missing fourth level. So we can date its loss to sometime after 1962. This is a groundskeeper, uh, you know, on the DPW staff. Tell them, you notice he's down on the ground, you know, telling the patients what to do. Uh, and you can see the Army has, has desegregated by now because... You know, he's telling them what to do. The horse heads are all there. And it's interesting if you look at the patterns of the algae that you can see on there, that they're the same patterns we saw last year when they put water in the fountain. So, next slide, please. These are photos of the loss of the Odeon. Now, I, I had been, until I saw these pictures, I was skeptical when they said that the Army had put in the firewall. Until I saw this picture right here, where the firewall runs through the center of a pillar. And I said, how the heck did they get the firewall through the center of a pillar? But I know the Army, didn't, the Army must have done that, because one, I got a picture from 1943 and that firewall is not there. And, and two, that sounds like something we would do. Um, the Odeon at that time was not a theater. In 1942, they built a floor in the middle of it, turned it into a two-floor building. The bottom floor was barracks for the band. There was a band assigned here. And the top floor was used for patient luggage storage. Um, and then they moved that out and made it the band's practice hall. It was the, the official numerical designation of the unit was the first hospital band, which I thought was kind of cool. Anyway, and of course we all know the story, you know, the fire in 1993, um, and you can see, you know, that firewall stopped at cold, you got the guy, you know, from, from, from Laura's, Laura's condo pouring water on the fire, and uh, anyway, I just figured I'd throw those in. Next slide, please. I love this picture. Okay. That's Joan of Arc. They all recognize her, right? And here you got a patient, because he's wearing his hospital, the patient hospital uniform is what it was called, and he's painting Joan of Arc with metallic paint. Okay? So everyone says, why'd the Army paint Joan yellow? And more importantly, why'd they paint the Indian yellow? Why'd they paint any of the statues yellow? Well, we've asked, um, you know, we're, we're planning on restoring it. Fred's going to talk here about a minute and a half about our statuary campaign. But if you remember our last seminar when the statue lady talked, 
Um, she said that they used to paint these statues with a metallic paint that did not age well, that would turn into like a muddy chocolate brown. And if you actually go and look at Joan, what you see is that on the highlight areas, the yellow is showing, but if you look in the areas that are protected from the weather, you'll see this muddy chocolate brown, you don't see the yellow. And so when the lady looked at paint samples, she said that that paint, which is chromium, which, is a, which has heavy metal toxicity issues, uh, which is why it's gonna cost so much to get her repainted, um, was a primer. And they had primed it, and then they had put a metallic paint on there, and what you're seeing is 50 years of weathering. Um, and the Indian statue, same thing, except he's more exposed, and so more of that paint weathered off. So, you know, since we got the statue here, I'm gonna toss it over to Fred, who's gonna talk about the statuary campaign and where we're doing. Thank you, Don. Because you know we were gonna hit you up for money. <laughs> well, I think most of you know that a year ago we started a campaign to raise money and undertake the task of restoring the statues that are on the, on the campus and, and bringing some of those statues that are in distressingly bad condition and, and are in storage, bringing them out of storage and putting them back together if we can. Uh, and, and also doing, doing research to identify statues that have been lost to the seminary in a variety of ways and at least try to find a way to acknowledge their existence and uh, find documentation and photographs of them. Uh, so it's a big effort and, uh, and the first step in the uh, uh, in the effort is um, is to raise money, and we um, uh, we have been conducting a, a, a fairly low key campaign. We will get more active later and and be, be more public. Uh, but we've raised twelve thousand dollars so far, and that gives us a comfort level to begin doing some actual work. You know, to actually contract with conservatives to do to do work on a statue. Well, actually, two statues, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, just to, uh, to give you a, an idea about how our appeal is constructed, we set some goals, um, some, some giving levels. Uh, we will actually accept money at any level, uh, but, but we set some giving levels, uh, the restoration level for people who donate $500, and the renewal level for people who donate $1,000, and the remembrance level for people who donate $2,500, and anyone who gives at, at one of those levels, their name will be uh, in, in, inscribed on a plaque that will will be placed here in the seminary, so so you get uh, bragging rights for well for all eternity, I think. Uh, but uh, but we've we've had uh, you know two two uh, two donors uh, who have contributed at the remembrance level, and one of them was a group donation honoring a family member. Uh, we may we may have a third that falls into that category. We. We've had three uh, renewal, $1,000 renewal uh, uh, gifts and, uh, and four restoration gifts, as well as a variety of other gifts of various sizes. Um, and as I say, adding up to uh, $12,000 so far. I, I, I mentioned that gives us a comfort level to go ahead and start commissioning work. And I spoke uh, this week with, with, a, with a conservator, someone who some of you may have met, She's been here at, at events like this in the past. Uh, Constance Stromberg, um, uh, she, will, she will be doing uh, paint tests on Joan of Arc uh, very shortly. Uh, and from that, we'll be telling us how long it'll take, what it will cost, and how soon she can schedule the actual work of restoring Joan of Arc to its to its original uh, condition. Um, we had hoped to begin that work in the spring. Given her schedule, it looks like it will be more likely the summer uh, when we will start that work. Uh, but the work can be done on site, which means outdoors, which means it will be possible to uh, uh, organize the work so that people can see it, can visit, can see a conservator at work. Uh, 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 we, you know, scraping paint, restoring, restoring the, uh, the the statue to the beautiful condition that it once was in, um, 
At the same time, there is another statue located very close to Joan of Arc, across the meadow, closer to the glen. That's the statue of, uh, uh, how do I pronounce this name? Uh, uh It's a marble statue. It doesn't suffer from the same problems that Joan of Arc does. Um, it's in actually very good condition, but it does need a cleaning. It does need to have all of the uh, uh, biological material that's growing in its crevices uh, removed. And so, so we think that by this summer, we will be in a position to restore two statues um, and, and then move on to the, to the others. We will get to Hiawatha uh, fairly, you know, next, next year, but it's gonna take raising more money uh, uh, to do that. So I would just ask all of you um, to think about the statues uh, as, as uh, think about how important they are to the overall character of the seminary and how valuable uh, um, uh, they are as a resource to our community and, and consider making a donation. Uh, there, I think there's probably information, yes there is, there is information, brochures, uh, on the table at the back of the room. Uh, uh, make a decision tonight or take one home with you and make a decision uh, at a later time. All the information you need about where to send it uh, will, be, uh, uh, will be provided on the brochure and I will, uh, I will write you a personal thank you letter uh, that, that, uh, that tells you that your, your donation, besides being appreciated by us, uh, gives you a, uh, a, a charitable uh, tax deduction uh, for 2011, not, not for your current taxes that are due soon, but for the next year. Um, and I think you will feel very, very good next year when you come back and see a statue uh, restored to all of its glory because of a contribution that you made. Thank you very much. All right. Bonnie's pointing her hand at the watch. I told you she was going to do that, Steve. Anyway, um, my mother gave $500. That was my Christmas present this year. So I gave her two foot of hedge at Mount Vernon for her Christmas present. Anyway, next slide, please. Now we're going to start the movie. I have to show you a couple of pictures. This is Bill Cosby standing right there in 1967. Right there. See? That's him. You don't recognize Bill Cosby? He was a, he was a, he was a, a Navy medic, Navy corpsman. Um, so he came to visit in 67. These pictures are from DPW at Walter Reed. They have a box full of pictures of National Park Seminary plays in the Odeon. So I just kind of threw them in so you can see the Odeon at work. And this picture right here, I got it on eBay. Um, it's taken facing that direction right over there. It's interesting because if you look at the doors in the back here, you can see the transoms, but not the doors themselves. And you can see the, the neat wallpaper and, you know, the door in the corner there when it's still open. So with that, we're going to go Alt-Tab. No, not that one. Go to Windows Media Player. Yep, don't hit Start yet, but click on it. And what I'm going to show you is a few minutes from a video um, that is a, a, from an Army television show called The Big Picture, which ran from 1951 to 1975. I think it's one of those ones that those of us who are old enough to remember just before they played the national anthem in the morning or at night, they'd run these propaganda films. Oh, usually, you know, the, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth. I'm showing my age. But this, this is a series, and this episode is called The Soldier Patient. And they've got this big master sergeant who never deployed, talking to all these wounded soldiers fresh back from Korea, and, and he's going to show, he's going to go visit Forrest Glenn. Now, I, I'll let it run for a little while and it'll show some of the stuff they did at Forest Glen in addition to the pictures. And if you listen very carefully, you might be able to hear the, the word. If you want to buy the video, you can get it from Amazon. Um, you found it, right? He found it. Okay. So if you would now hit the play button right there. 
And let's hope it's still queued up. Nope. Oh well, it restarted, so we don't want to watch that, do we? Go to chapter 3. Actually, go to chapter 4. You can see it's, you know, very sophisticated graphics. Yeah, hit, hit click play. Click play. Click play. There we go. This, you, you'll see that's the building, you know, where the dry cleaner used to be and where Allen Automotive is. And, um, and you'll, be, you'll see Linden Lane in the background there, but I just think this is interesting because you've got the guy, again, you know, they're teaching him how to change a tire. If I could figure out how to back this thing up, go down here and drag it back to right about there. There. Let's see what happens when I do that. Oh, nope, nope, a little more. Right about there. Stop. Nope, now you gotta go forward slightly. Yeah, that's physical. Oh, now back up a little. We're almost to where I want to be. A little more. There. We're just going to leave it here and let it run. Now, if you would click the full screen right there, you can tell we rehearsed this, huh? There we go. Click. Double click. This was shot in 1954. You can see it hadn't changed much. And then you see the soldiers, now they're going to come out and they're going to pose. The villa in better days. The gym in much better days. That is right. That was the that was a walk the walkway from the porch of the maidens over to the gym. Now they're walking across the bridge, which isn't there anymore. I don't know if I would have sat on that railing. I've seen the Army's repair pictures from 1942. And now we're back to, you know, learning how to drive a car. And this is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll play a little bit of this. You know, you don't think until you see footage like this, you know, there's a lot of work involved in changing a tire. They also had, at least during World War II, a trolley car that DC donated to them that was just parked there so that soldiers could practice getting on and off the trolley, you know, because it's at a different height and things like that. They had a couple of these cars that were donated that were actually, you'll see, they got the, hook, they got the, the knob for the hook, and I don't know. I think that's enough? Or do you want to keep watching? Okay, we'll keep watching. They told me to, Bonnie. And now Anne's saying the same thing. Okay, I'm going to stop because they're telling me to stop. Anyway, thank you for listening. I'm available to answer questions. If you would, on your way out, as is traditional at one of these functions, please quietly stack your chair in the corner. I say quiet. You heard me say quietly, Joyce. Um, we would greatly appreciate it because otherwise we've got to stack them. And thank you. And I say I'll be up here to answer questions, and we'll just leave this running. But I have officially terminated, so...